uh, of course, a long uh, uh, standing colleague as well as a very good friend from many, many years and, and a you know, neighbor. So it was uh, lovely to have Professor uh, In Ram Prakash from Ayuka. He is currently the dean there. He is one of the leading uh, people in astronomical instrumentation in India, and he has a very wide global recognition. So he well, he is currently the associate program director of the TMT India project, the contribution to the 30 meter telescope. He is a co-PI of the suit instrument, uh, which will fly soon on Aditya L1. Uh, he was the co-PI of Robopole and RoboAO, and uh, didn't go to Robocop or anything, but uh, then uh, currently he is uh, co-PI of uh, Valop, uh, which you'll hear about in this talk today. And he is the PI of the Devasthal Optical Telescope Integral Field Spectrograph, DOTFs. Okay, so Ramprakash is an engineer by training. We share the history of engineers getting into science uh, things. So he did a rapid master's and PhD within a year of each other or something in 98. And then even a year before that, he was already a visiting fellow at Caltech. And then he's was a postdoc at Institute of Astronomy, Cambridge, before he came back in 2000, and has been leading the instrumentation effort at IUCA. Very, you know, that's a very visible effort, and uh, I'm really, again, delighted that he's chosen to give a colloquium on a topic uh, which uh, is of great interest uh, to me personally. And it's basically, I'll read this, the Through the Veil, of dust to inflation. So this is the story of how instrumentation leads the way to you know, discovering something fancy, as fancy as inflation in the universe. So without further ado, let me uh, ask Ram Prakash to deliver his colloquium. So I am, um, thank you Tarun and Vikram for inviting me and allowing me to give this talk here. I don't know when was the last time I gave a talk here, probably 93 or 94, when you organized, again you are involved Tarun in that uh, young astronomers meet, we were young at some point, right? So <laughs> young astronomers meet, which is jointly organized in Bangalore at that time, and I gave a talk at that time, I think. And after that, I've not given a talk. It's been, I don't know, ages. And um, also, <clears throat> it's the first time I'm giving a public in-person talk since COVID hit us a couple of years ago. So it's, it's, been, it's been a while. So bear with me if I'm a bit rusty <laughs> on <laughs> presentation skills. Um, so um, today, I am going to talk to you about this work I am involved in, um, in a part of a big collaboration. And I should warn you that it's a work in progress, uh, the results of which should come out uh, maybe four, five years from now, when, when, we have, when we have really done the work. But the, the idea itself is so exciting, and the journey itself is so challenging that I thought I should share that with you. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting program. So, um, so don't expect final results today from my presentation, but um, the, the tantalizing possibility of what we could do uh, itself is so, so, so interesting that, that it's... Um, um, but before I go on to that, because I have not given a talk here for a while, and many new faces are there, maybe youngsters are there. 
I thought I'll give you a little bit background of what we do at IUCA in general at the instrumentation lab. I, I work in the instrumentation lab mostly, so what we do in the instrumentation lab and just set the stage, put the context around which um, we, we work and, and build this instrument for this, this particular program. So if I have to put what we do in two slides, one is we work on developing niche technologies, R&D activities. No lab can afford to ignore that generally. And uh, we don't do everything under the sun. We, I concentrate on specific areas like uh, application of optical fibers for astronomy, um, adaptive optic systems, developing adaptive optics. Uh, many of you know what adaptive optics is. It's the, the system which is used to compensate for the effect of atmosphere as light passes through it in real time. Uh, we develop such systems, and we also develop a lot of electronics, especially for sensor controllers, detector controllers. So I'll say a little bit more about that part. I will not touch, with lack of time, I will not touch much of it. These are the kind of controllers we develop, which is called IUCA Digital Sampling Array Controller. You can see a pretty dense board, 25 layers, more than 2,000 parts per surface, and so on. It's pretty complicated devices. We design and develop these things, and we productize them in the lab, and we sell them. So this is another instrument, another um, controller for near infrared. The previous one was for visible sensors, CCDs kind of things, and this one is for infrared uh, devices. I will not get into the details of all that. Or, but I will say that look, some of these sensors which we develop, the controllers we send, develop are used in the biggest observatories around the world. So we sell them, they buy from us. We productize them, sell them, provide support, all that kind of activity. Although we are an R&D facility. So that's a, the that's a kind of activity we have. In addition to that, we also do DD, which is design, develop, integrate, and commission instruments from what I call scratch to sky. You start scratching your head about a concept and then deliver it on sky produce data. So uh, we do that, and there are many instruments, and I don't mention that. Uh, dot tips was one of them uh, for the Indian 3.6 meter telescope. It's a multi IFU integral field spectrograph. <coughs> RoboAO for um, the adaptive optic system for observatories abroad and in India. Uh, Wallop, which I'll be talking more about later and uh, SUIT, which is a space instrument, the first time Ayuka's lab has ventured into space instrumentation, solar ultraviolet imaging telescope, and so on and so forth. So most of today's talk is about wallop, but don't worry, I won't talk too much of instrumentation, I'll focus mostly on science for today. I, I was oscillating between what to focus on science or instruments, and then I thought maybe a little bit of instrumentation, but mostly on science. This is just a slide which shows the kind of instruments. This is dot tapes, this is RoboAO, uh, this is um, suit on board Aditya and so on. And we also are involved in a uh, big way in uh, the 30 meter telescope program. Uh, it's an international program as you all know. India is supposed to contribute majorly in building several of these components, especially the components under the primary mirror this entire complicated optomechanical system, almost everything you see on that figure is being built in India for the telescope, the TMT telescope. So in Ayuka, Aries and uh, um, IA are the PI institutions for India's participation in TMT, and as part of it, a lot of effort is being done at Ayuka also uh, towards this project. So I'll stop there to give a context of you know, what we do in the lab both technology development wise as well as uh, instrument development wise. Let's come back to the main topic of today's presentation. I'll start with introducing you to the two um, acronyms we keep using. WALLOP stands for Wide Area Linear Optical Polarimeter. It's the instrument being built at Ayuka. And PACIFE, um, of course, it has to be a Greek name because we have Greek collaborators. So the, it's the survey um, which will be carried out with the instrument. And the whole top 
today would be about the motivation of uh, what science motivates to build these instruments and what we expect to come out at the end of it. And if you want to uh, uh, know more about it, please uh, have a look at this paper. So it all starts from the real beginning. You can't go beyond this beginning, right? It's the very beginning. We believe our universe started with the Big Bang. And the Big Bang itself was not an instantaneous event. I think we believe it, the universe expanded exponentially for a very tiny fraction of the time in the beginning, a phase called inflation. Many of us know about it. But we infer that in the, such, a, such a thing happened by looking at stuff which we can see today. And it's all indirect evidence. I mean, people have, clever people have come up with saying, if this happened in the beginning, that will lead to what we see today, kind of uh, explanations. But there's no direct smoking gun evidence yet for inflation. And one such evidence people have predicted is that if you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, it should show at a very, very tiny level certain kind of polarization, what is called B-mode polarization, this kind of curly structures in the, the, the polarization signature in the, in the cosmic microwave background radiation. And if you can detect it, theorists say that's telling us that inflation definitely happened. And people have been looking for this. And there have been claims that they detected it and which have been refuted in the past, that saying that it's not really detected. Some systematics was interpreted as this detection because it's not done properly. So it's a big thing. <clears throat> so what is the problem in detecting this? The main problem is if you look at this graph, this graph shows what we see as this is some foreground, what we see at these frequencies these frequencies of these, um, um, the various contributions from different sources, like spinning dust, synchrotron, um, Brahmsharang radiation, uh, thermal dust radiation, etc., and the CMB. So you can see that at these wavelengths, the thermal dust emission dominates. And the CMP is just, this is a logarithmic scale. So it's a, you know, submerged in it. So if I try to detect, so all we have to do really is to model this thermal dust, remove it properly, and this is all coming from our galaxy. Remove it properly, and if you look at the wavelength where other things are still low, somewhere around here, and the CMB dominates, so measure the thermal dust here, model it down to this where the CMB dominates, remove it, and then you get the underlying signal. That's a, that's a kind of game people have been playing. This is all very good and works very well. I mean, to a large extent, it has been working. Except that this <coughs> modeling of the thermal dust and scaling it from measured frequency to the, the needed frequency where the signal is strongest, has been a tough game. The reason why it has been difficult, anyway, this slide just shows that uh, it's not just a thermal thing is, it's a, you, you, you model it as a modified black body curve, uh, the thermal emission, and then you, you scale it to the right frequency and remove it. But the problem in doing that is, if you look at any given line of sight in the sky, even at very high galactic latitudes, in any given direction in the sky, the line of sight is going to cross many dust clouds or molecular cloud patches, not one most of the time. And each of these dust clouds are completely different entities at different distances. They have different properties. The magnetic fields threading through them are different orientations. And what you measure sitting here is the net effect of the dust emission. Because this, these clouds are basically optically thin, so at submillimeter wavelengths. So you are seeing the net integrated emission of all the stuff which is emitting in, along the line of sight. It's not just any one of them. But, and then the integrated thing is translated into the CMB dominated frequency, the lower frequency. And that doesn't work well because the way this one would scale to that frequency and this cloud contribution scale to that frequency will be different. So there's just not a sum. 
It's not just direct translation. You have to do this properly. But you don't have that information. You don't have that 3D information. That's a problem. So this was pointed out pretty early by Tassis et al. in this paper. And then over time, many people noticed this. And now it is a, there's a common understanding that this frequency decorrelation, this effect, is the most unconstrained effect in this game of trying to remove the foreground and getting to the B mode polarization underneath. It is a pretty well understood um, issue here, and that needs to be dealt with. So once Tassis et al. noticed this, we, Tassis, of course, is a Greek collaborator in this program, uh, we said, look, let's see if there's really multiple lines of sight, multiple clouds in each of these lines of sight. If there is only one cloud in most of the lines of sight, or many such lines of sight exist, you just look at those areas for the B-mode polarization. Why bother with the one which is bad? Of course, you always go above the galaxy, which is very bad, high galactic latitudes. But even there, pick the, pick the good places. So we looked at uh, areas near the galactic poles, and we saw that most light sight lines have definitely more than one component. And this you can do with H1 mapping. You can pick up these uh, molecular clouds associated with dust clouds with H1 data. So they are there. Once the standardizing in, uh, indication came, we did a more extensive study of an entire polar regions. And you can see that uh, two to three, maybe even four, components along lines of sight, they are not negligible, they are dominating. So you pick almost any line, so this color coding is the number of clouds along each, each pixel or each line of sight, and each pixel is about a degree in the sky. So many, almost everywhere there are many, many clouds along each line. So this idea that you can make the integrated submillimeter measurement and scale it to CMB wavelength with a modified black body and get away with it, clearly it's not going to work. You have to account for this. And this, we have systematically shown that there are not many patches where this effect is not there. Almost any site you pick, you have to deal with it. So how do you deal with it? Again, uh, what you do is you look at this H1 uh, spectra. You see these filamentary structures and you compare with the polarization vectors which pick up the magnetic field orientation. You see them, a lot of them are aligned. The structures are aligned, polarization vectors, basically. So these filamentary structures, which are also we understand that. That's, it's molecular cloud where dust forms and dust gets aligned, non-aligned, non, -aligned, non um, so spherical uh, dust grains can get aligned with the magnetic fields, and that emits polarization, and the polarized, that emits light. Light gets polarized because the dust grains are aligned by the magnetic field. So that's natural. So we use this information and identify lines of sight which is more than one dust component and only one dust component. And this is just a map. So uh, we create two samples. One is a control sample where only one cloud exists in the line of sight. And there is a target sample where multiple clouds exist in our line of sight. And we know which pixels in the sky these two control and target clouds are from this map, this north and this south. And then go to Planck data. Look at the 353 megahertz Planck data and the 217 data. Find out the difference in orientation of the polarization vector and find out the the shape of that distribution of those difference for clouds which have only one, uh, line of sight which has only one cloud, and line of sights which have more than one cloud. You can clearly see there are two different distributions. So which means that it, the, 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 the evidence exists in Planck data. That when you do the scaling, the lines of sight which has more than one cloud along the lines of sight shows much broader distribution in orientation of position angles of magnetic field 
compared to the ones which have only one cloud along the line. So it's clear in the data it's there. So this is also uh, in this paper. So it's clear that there's an effect and we, we have shown that it, it, this, this needs to be accounted for in the Planck thing. Now how do we deal with it? We can deal with it by knowing that the emission which we in submillimeter wavelength produced by this aligned elongated dust grains aligned by magnetic fields. So this is the magnetic field direction and the dust grains if they are not spherical they are elongated which is the case very often. They spin and when the spin interacts with the direction of the magnetic field because of their magnetic material embedded in the dust their, their short axis tend to get aligned with the magnetic field direction like this and the long axis ends up perpendicular to the magnetic field direction and this dust can uh, emit some millimeter and that's the emission you see in some millimeter wavelengths but on the other hand this dust also is an a good absorber at visible wavelengths so if there is a star behind the dust cloud as the light passes through the, uh, this dust cloud the light is extinct more along this direction than in this direction so the light gets preferably polarized this way so the emission gets polarized preferably this way perpendicular to the B field because emission is parallel more parallel to the long axis while extinction is parallel more to the long axis so the polarization visible is uh, perpendicular along the B axis so but they are correlated so by understanding that it's the same dust cloud which could be leading to this phenomena you can use this effect as a proxy to measure what individual dust clouds are doing and then try to use that for a better foreground subtraction that's a game now this slide is also showing that if i compare the emission and degree of polarization in visible a tight correlation right? in, in various parameterization ways if you compare emission versus extinction induced polarization is visible they are tightly correlated so they, they, the, both the effects are coming from the same uh, same uh, population of dust so you're probing the same thing uh, by two two mechanisms it's also seen here this is just a plank uh, polarized dust emission map and you can see that that's very i mean we all know that this is pretty good alignment uh, you know, the magnetic field lines align very well with the dust uh, lines also and the emission uh, polarization orientations also line up very well so this is all good we, we clearly understand this now how do we use this the problem when we are using this uh, for as a proxy is it submillimeter wavelengths you are looking at a cone your telescope is beaming into a cone in space and collecting all the radiation from that solid angle but if you are looking at stars, you are picking one line of sight, one pencil beam. So you can't just use one star and say that's exactly what happens all over the place. So you need to have a large number of stars filling up this cone to have an, an idea of what is going on within that cone from which you collect the submillimeter radiation. You have to have enough sampling both in depth as well as in breadth. Otherwise, uh, you can't get this picture properly. So there are these uh, issues that need to be properly addressed for. So we, when we looked at the data, existing polarization data, especially at high galactic latitudes, this is ga galactic latitudes, this is the number of stars per square degree where polarization has been measured. Of course, within close to the disk of the galaxy, a lot of measurements, no problem. If you go far away, how do you have a one star per square degree or something measured in polarization? almost nothing available. So if you want to play the previous game of filling in this field, which is typically a degree, square degree field, pixel in sky for submillimeter uh, surveys, you, you hardly get a star from existing data, this. So that's a problem. That's why we said, look, this has to be addressed, and that's why we are building these two instruments called wallops, wide area linear optical polarimeters, building two of them, one will go to Northern Hemisphere at the observatory in Greece, a 1.3 meter Skinakas telescope, 
And the other one will go to South Africa on a one meter telescope in Sutherland Observatory of South African Astronomical Observatory. I'll conduct a four year survey of every part greater than B, B greater than plus minus 30 here and here simultaneously from both hemispheres. Provide a few million confident polarization measurements. So that's aim. So this is just a solder box model of the two instruments. This is the southern instrument. That's the northern instrument. They look kind of different because the telescopes are different, the optics is different, space available, all kinds of constraints. I won't get into the instrumentation details of that. But they are basically same kind of instruments. This will go to South Africa and this will go to Greece. And they are being built in Ayuka currently. They have amazingly large field of view. Nobody has built instruments, polarization, polarimeters of this field of view because we need to cover large areas of the sky. And they have to be photon noise limited at the 0.1% level. So I'll come to that point a bit later, but why we need such an accuracy. But that's, that's a requirement. And it has to be rapid because we have to cover thousands of square degrees in the sky. And if you have to finish the survey in a reasonable time, it should be a rapid instrument, which has to be able to measure polarization a large number of stars very quickly. So we can read more about these instruments, its calibration process, this whole whole details of this in two papers which have come out and they're more in the pipeline, they are in preparation. So at least this will give you an instrument uh, details about the, 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 the instrument's difficulties and the challenges in building that instrument. What we are going to do with this, changing this paradigm instead of having a hardly a star measured in polarization at that level per square degree, we are going to get several hundred stars per square degree measured. And the total integrated volume would be a thousand fold increase compared to the state of the art in polarization measurement in those directions of the sky towards the galactic north and south. So that's what we are trying to do. Uh, uh, so what we then use, it is, if you have that many large number of st stars, and if you go sufficiently deep, some of the stars will be in the foreground. Some of them will be, let's say, behind, between these two clouds, as an example. Some of them will be in here. And if you know the distances to these stars, which we can from Gaia, Gaia has measured accurate distances to many stars billions of stars already. So we get combined that data with the polarization data. Then you know where the dust clouds are. Polarization position angles, you can measure the orientation of the magnetic fields. You can use certain, based on turbulence, etc. You can get also some handed on the strength of the magnetic fields, etc. And then use that for better CMB, uh, better foreground subtraction. And I'll come to that in a minute. Now, while we are building the instrument, we have not been waiting. What we are do, being doing is to use this instrument called Robopole, which was also built in Ayuka, but and commissioned on the Skinakas Observatory in 2013. That's been op operating there since then. Uh, that was a collaboration between, um, again, an international collaboration between multiple institutions. Uh, it was this the Skinakas Observatory. It was basically built for looking at uh, uh, about 100 blazars and monitor them for a period of four years in polarization. Uh, that was the purpose of building Robopole. But um, the interesting thing is it used a special kind of mask in the middle which kills the background. You can see this area is full of it's, it's bright skylight, but in here you can see these, these, these four spots are the four images of a particular star or a blazer. And around that, the background is very low. The sky has been killed by this mask. And um, so, this, so you, when you're looking at blazars, which are points also, you pull them into this, that hole and observe. So the wallops are now designed to the, give that kind of sensitivity, low sky background sensitivity over a half degree field of view. That, that's the whole idea. This Robopole instrument itself has a 13 arc minute field of view, although it was designed to look for point sources. It also has a 13 degree, 13 arc minute field of view. So we decided to use that Robopole to do some preliminary survey and convince ourselves that building wallop is worth it. 
So what we did is we identified in the Planck field areas where dust emission is the least. What is the signal, what is the smallest dust emission signal we would have to try to measure if you are looking at high galactic latitudes. Remember, in, in the galactic disk, there's a lot of dust. And the polarization is very strong. That's why there's so many measurements in the galactic disk direction. You go away, there's very little dust. The polarization induced from background stars are very little in those directions. But what is the level? Can we measure it? So we picked up some very least dusty region towards one of the galactic polar regions and measured polarization there with Robopore to see what kind of signals are we going to get. And we see that it's about 0.4, more than 50% of the stars in that, that the least dusty region still produce about 0.4% level polarization, which is why our instrument has to be at least as good as 0.1% accuracy in polarization. Otherwise, we won't get even three sigma measurements there. So we know what we are trying to do, at least 0.1% level polarization measurement sufficiently deep and sufficiently broad. That, that's a requirement. Now, once you get that, you can do this kind of decomposition. You can say with Gaia distances uh, from polarization information, I'll come to that in a minute, how you do that, how to decouple this dust um, components along the line of sight, which could have different magnetic field orientations, and orientation could change as with, even within the given dust cloud as, you, as projected on the sky, it could change that you need to account for that. This is just a slide which shows how many stars you expect per square degree if you go to a certain depth, reasonably, within reasonable exposures, which we can achieve with Robopore. And you can say that about, if you go to about these blue lines or if you hit about 16th magnitude as the faintest stars you can measure 0.1% polarization in reasonable time, you can get few hundred stars per square degree. That's good. That's good enough to fill a one degree pixel of a submillimeter observation. So a few hundred, that, that's good. So if you can get hit 16 magnitude, that's, that's, that's good. We also did some sample uh, look at specific sight lines where we said, look, what is shown here is if we look at this black circle and the red circle and look at these two diagrams here, this is a high galactic direction, high galactic uh, latitude direction, we just hand-picked. Along this dark circle, if you look at this diagram here, there are two dust clouds, or two molecular clouds. This is just H1, so it's an H1 velocity map. So here you pick one velocity bin in H1, so you get a particular cloud out, because it's moving at a particular speed, so the velocity is shifted, and you just pick that one out. So along this, red, this direction, you get two bumps in the spectrum, which means there are two components, an intermediate velocity cloud and a low velocity cloud. While if you look at this red direction here, this intermediate velocity cloud has very little contribution. It's mostly dominated by the low velocity, the, the, the farther cloud. So if you look at these two line of sight and try to do polarization measurement, which we did with Robopole, and then we decomposed this and made polarization measurements and, dis and established distances to these two uh, clouds and their polarization properties, etc. And you can read all about that in this paper. So we demonstrated that if you build a Robopore-like instrument, we can do this. We can go down to that uh, magnitude faintness. We can go down to that sensitivity of polarization of 0.1% measurement, and we can do it reasonably. We have the mechanism. We have the, the, the understanding of how to do this. That's demonstrated. There is also, then we took it further. We produced some simulated data and the, to demonstrate this. So this is just an animation which shows polarization measurement and this, this error bus, you can see how well you measure polarization and the, and the color coding is the distance. So this polarization, if you look at with a uh, 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 submillimeter, you will see that an integrated effect, and you see the spread in position angle. But you can see here that let me pause this for a moment. Oops. For a moment. Oops. 
faster than I can speak. And you can see um, <coughs> that if you if you just project it into one point, you see some integrated one with the position angles all, you know, spread. And that's what we are going to measure in submillimeter. That's not the real information. And in here, let me pause here. So here, if you look at the Q and U Stokes vectors, which is like the two orthogonal linear position components, you can see two clumps here, clearly. So which means there are two com com contributions to the polarization, at least two contributions, two sources are there. And if you just look at one, which is Q here, you can see as a function of distance, if you mark either U or Q as a function of distance, you can see both of them just separate out into two clumps, which means they are coming from different distances. And you can see the jump in polarization. That's where the cloud is, because that's where the cloud is adding the additional polarization by extinction. And then you can do that game for multiple clouds. If you have enough sample density, you can do that game for multiple clouds and then create the 3D tomographic structure of the clouds, the distances, the induced polarization, et cetera, et cetera. And you can read all about that in this paper, which has just come out. So that was with simulated data. <laughs> but we have a robopole. So we did about, picked about 2,000 stars. And they, of course, a grad student, right? You pick a grad student and say, OK, you put that each star of these 2,000 stars into the sender sensitive box of the robopole, where you have to observe one star at a time, and do that. That's your, that's your PhD, right? <laughs> so you do that. That's what students are for. So you do that, and you get this data. And then you use that data to create this kind of 3D tomographic maps. So this is a cone as we are projecting into the sky. And this is, this is a, uh, one of them is a horizontal cut, and this is a vertical cut. And this is polarization, this is position angle. So you can see that in real data also, a lot of interesting structures are there. Even with one field, just 2,000 stars, painstakingly collected by uh, uh, a diligent PhD student, put together, you can recreate the 3D tomographic structure. And this is just one cut, uh, one vertical cut and horizontal cut, but you can see the structure and you can produce the whole tube with that data. So that's good. So we have the whole machinery ready. We are just waiting for the instruments to be up there on the telescope. So what, how do we use this data? What, once we have this information of the 3D structure, how do we use it? At the moment, as we discussed earlier, as we mentioned earlier, the modified black body of the dust curve is just subtracted on a pixel basis. So what we are going to do is to produce enough information of the dust cloud content on each of those pixels. How many lines dust components are contributing into each of these pixels? And you can do this scaling on a cloud by cloud basis per pixel. So that you can get at the CMB frequencies what effect it has. And then that would be the one which is be used as for foreground subtraction. Of course, you need a lot of other data for uh, determining where the clouds start, where cloud ends. Things get pretty complicated as things go. And if it's already complicated with two clouds in one line of sight, so when it gets to three, four, et cetera, it can get pretty complicated. But I think we can do it. At least, at the very least, we can tell people which are the really bad lines of sight, right? Mask them. Don't use them for your B-mode polarization look, uh, surveys. This, these are really bad places to look for. Avoid those places. At least that, that kind of information you can give. There are, of course, when there's a program like this, there are, of course, other byproducts which has to be, which has come out. One of the difficulties we felt Real difficulties is when you do polarimetry of sky, of course, visible polarimetry, and look at the sky, there are no, almost no calibrators available. So you want to make a measurement and you calibrate your instrument, calibrators are not available. There's too few. 
they were produced ages ago. This is the whole list of calibrators available on these papers, almost the entire list of calibrators. The main problem is almost all of these calibrators, so called calibrators, are variable at the level of 0.1 percent, which we want to measure. Uh, they don't work. So you can see that this, this, you can see these circled ones, this variable, variable, variable. So they're called calibrators at the time when you didn't have to hit that kind of sensitivity in polarization measurement, but now they are not longer good. So out of 13 standards, seven are variable, four may be variable. So what is left at that level, right? So that's a problem. So we had to create our own grid of calibrators, and there's only 13 in the whole sky, even if they were good. We are doing whole sky surveys, right? Almost whole sky surveys. So they're not good enough to calibrate our instrument sufficiently frequently and sufficiently accurately. So there's a paper which says, therefore, they should no longer be used to polarize standard stars for precision work. It's been, people have been studied this systematically and said these, these are useless at that level. So we had to undertake a calibrator creation program. So which, for which also we used Robopore. So this is just a um, um, graph which shows in right ascension and declination and number of calibrators. Remember I said when for Robopore the main purpose was to look at blazar fields. And the robo, all, while the blazar was in the mask in the middle, the extended field was looking at other stars in the sky. So they, we, by looking at those stars over a period of four years, we picked up candidates which could be stable enough. And then we used other catalogs, etc., and picked up candidates which could be stable enough to be used as calibrators. And then did a three-year survey with Robopole focusing on those candidates, spread over the right ascension, declination, so that they are available all over the sky, all through the seasons. And then these are some preliminary results. A uh, few nights per month since 2017, we had been running this calibrator survey. And we have found about 46 cali stable calibrators at better than 0.1%. So out of maybe two left at that level from the previous uh, existing data set, we might have 46. So this would be a real useful data for anybody who is doing polarization. Uh, uh, measurements in the sky invisible to these stars. <clears throat> now, just uh, so last couple of slides. Uh, this is the collaboration, the, it's the international collaboration of many institutions involved with different contributions. IUCA, at IUCA, our contribution is building the instrument. The, the, the VALOP instruments are being designed and built at IUCA. It's all being funded by many sponsors, the European Research Council, the National Science Foundation in the US, um, uh, uh, European private funding agencies, Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, Infosys Foundation, National Research Foundation, South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these contributions are at the level of one to two million dollars or euros or something. So it's, it's a substantial big program in that sense. Uh, and you can see that the scope of the work, I mean, the amount of work which is involved in such a program it's not just building the instrument, putting and getting some data. There's the amount of background work you have to do to prepare for it and to, to be ready to use the data when it starts flowing is tremendous. You need a big team to do that. It's not one or two people effort. So this is basically our team. I said most, I think many people are missing here. Uh, this is taken from one of the uh, conferences we had in Norway a couple of years ago. Uh, I should say Siddharth Maharashtra, uh, Maharana was my PhD student who just finished and he started his first postdoc. Uh, he was basically the brain behind the design and of the instrument. We also had a student from Greece, uh, John Kipriotakis, which also worked on the design and uh, development of the uh, instrument. And there is also uh, Twin Ghosh, which many of us know, uh, who is also a faculty advisor. Bhuvanesha, uh, who is helping us with um, how to convert the raw measured uh, data from for the, for the instrument to polarization, to do the for proper photometry to polarimetry, how to do that. And that's a big task when you have to do that accurately to 0.1 person level. So he is helping us with that and a lot of others. We also have collaborators at the University of Oslo. We don't have, in this team, we don't have CMB experts. 
And so we produce this data, we produce these maps, and somebody has to use it. Right? And so we have collaborators at uh, Oslo um, who are experts in this. They have been uh, previously been, all, all the time has been in the, in the business of doing foreground removal for uh, cosmic microwave background. So they are teaming with us and they have started looking at the data. They are telling us what kind of data, what kind of format, what kind of way in which we have to provide the data to them so that they can absorb into their system in a way that the CMP foregrounds can be corrected and so on and so forth. So that's basically it. Uh, we are also very happy that in the recently concluded US Decadal Survey, it's a 10-year vision, Decadal vision for US astronomy, uh, they, they actually especially mentioned our program saying that kind of things is what we really need to see in the next, this 2020s, this decade. Uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the title of that US Decadal Survey document. And it's available uh, publicly. We have, we have been explicitly called out in that. We have been also called out in the Nature of Astronomy Mission Control, uh, you know, these snippets which come out in Nature of Astronomy about these two instruments which are coming out and how interesting they are and how important they are. So have a look at that if you're interested. This is for um, this particular science, but we are building these instruments. We get this data in four years, five years, but this instrument is not going to die off after four years. So we have an imp even more ambitious plan where we want to extend that into an all-sky polarization survey, reach out to 16.5, magnitudes. We need new telescopes. So right now we have only two, one in the north and one in the south. We will need two more, again one in the north and south, so that we can finish that all-sky survey in a reasonable time. We need about 10 telescope years. So if we have four telescopes, we can finish it in three years, four years, something, accounting for inefficiencies and so on. So that's, that's our grand plan. So if any of you are interested, really massive polarization surveys, and big wads of money sitting somewhere not knowing where to use that for. We have a project. We have to build a telescope. We have to build additional wall of polarimeters, put them on the telescope, conduct the survey, produce the exciting results. Right? Because this survey, like all legacy big surveys like this, is built and done for one science. But it's going to be a big survey package, the data package, which is to see factor of 1,000 improvement in the data, existing data. Uh, it's going to produce a, all kinds of new discoveries in the interstellar medium science, for example. The science of the dust. It's an amazing data set to study the dust grains in the, in, in the galaxy. Amazing the, uh, data set to study anomalous polarization producing objects in the sky. We're going to just throw out, uh, you know, the trash we are going to throw out is going to be worth more than the, you know, the gold we are going to use first. So keep an eye on that. And if you want to know more about what is going on with Pacifay, please look at this website and some of the papers which are coming. Thank you. <laughs> Answer questions if we have time. Um, this program and this uh, uh, method is for the galactic contribution. So, is is there any extragalactic contribution that is also significant, like you know, radiation coming through field galaxies? No, no. The galaxy dominates. Okay. Uh, uh, that foreground dominates everything else. And uh, will this instrument be sensitive for polarization measurements from like the white dwarfs? Yes, yes. That's why I said, or um, like, uh, uh, magnetars or. Um, anomalous polarization producing objects, various kinds of binaries and so on. So they will be all there in our fields. No, does it have some like timing capabilities as well? Can one look at like, you know, uh, like... Pulse Depending on the timing, so what we are going to do is to, our survey plan currently is to do a shallow survey of the whole, sorry. Initially pick up a small area, go deep, as deep as you can but it's a small region, get that data. While people are working on that data, understanding the systematics of going really deep and getting the best out of it, we will complete a shadow survey of the whole sky. And then keep doing that over period to get it as deep as the deepest one. 
So over time, the depth increases. So we will have many epochs, but it's go not going to be at the time scale of days, or it's not going to be at the time scale of hours. But as I said, the instrument is not going to die in four years. It's built, it's at the observatory. So after that, if you want to use it for a, uh, let's say, multi-observation per night kind of study, very well use it. And um, one more thing. Uh, the um, target that you have for number of sources per square degree in the sky, that should taper off at the high latitudes? If it's an uniform survey of the sky. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 plotted the, it's plotted the other way. That is why it's taproving off this way. No, you so the, the number of, number how of deep you can go and the number of stars you are going to leave out. That's what is shown there. It, it's just a plotted the other way around because we want to capture what we are able to do. Otherwise, the usual way to plot that is like that. It is plotted like that as functional distance. It's the stars which are left out. Uh, so you are planning to do all sky survey or uh, you can systematically randomize the sky? Uh, no, this is about the... 30 degree latitudes. Uh -huh. North 30 degree, about 30 degree and south about 30 degree. Yeah, uh, I mean the For... remaining sky. Yeah. So uh, you told that you are doing... Now, how are we going to fill up that sky? Huh. So, so it is... Yeah. Uh, so as a PhD program running, where there is a, there's some smart fellow is sitting and writing that survey planner. It has to take into account all kinds of things, like you don't want one patch here, one patch here, one patch here, completely disjoint. You don't want to focus everything on one side and nothing at the other side. You have to account for moon. You have to account for weather. You have to account for telescope downtime. You have to account for something funny happened, like an aircraft passed through your field of view or something. You know, all kinds of things. Yeah, to, there are things which can be planned, like the moon or the major weather patterns. There are there can be things which cannot be planned for, for which you have to react and adjust your survey accordingly. So there's a whole complicated um, you know, thing has to be developed to do the survey planner. And that's something which we are working on. So I cannot answer your question in one line where we say, are we randomly going to pack? Target. We are not. We are going to tile them in some systematic fashion. But the tiling systematic fashion, when you project it to into the, from the plane of the sky into the actual, you know, the shape of the sky with the projection taken into account, itself will have to have a problem, right? The projection effects itself will have to account. So simple tiling is not going to work on a plain paper. It has to account for the projection effects of that as you move towards the galactic poles from the equator. So these kind of details have to be worked out. So it's not random. It's not like adjacent tiles. It's a little more complicated than that. And then you have to account for these real life things. Of, um, so it's by itself is a PhD program. <laughs> yeah. So another question is that uh, these are ground-based uh, optical uh, telescopes. So what about the Earth atmosphere? I mean, how you take care of Yeah, so we are doing photometry of reasonably bright stars at 16 magnitude, which are, by modern standard, they are bright stars, right? So it's, uh, atmosphere doesn't have, oh, you mean polarization induced by the Earth's atmosphere? Yeah, we have done that measurement at 0.1% level, most of the time it's not a problem. If you go below to 0.05% level, and the dust content in the atmosphere is large and it has some reason to be aligned. Random dust is not a problem. The problem comes if the dust is such that the source of illumination of the dust, the dust package itself, and where we stand, they combine in a way that they lead to net polarizations. We will have a problem at 0.05%, not at 0.1%. So seeing is not a big uh, issue here. No. I mean, how many nights do you get at uh, your telescope? Yeah, so we have um, uh, the Skinakas Observatory. That telescope will be fully dedicated for this survey. Mm -hmm. Every night is available. 
the so how many nights does uh, it get so, per so year? From Robert Paul experience, it's about we have said we can get about 200 usable nights usable. every year. The Southern Observatory is smaller telescope, so exposures have to be longer. And they are offering four nights for us and one night for them. So one in five. So that efficiency factor will come in. So again, roughly 200 to 200. It's slightly better site, so you get more um, more nights on a on a year. And also in the in the southern instrument, we are designed in a way that it actually gives 35 by 35, which kind of compensate for the aperture loss by covering more area in one exposure. So this is a, we are playing this game. So roughly they are matching. So all of the order of 200 nights per year. So in India, do we have any telescope which fits the bill? I mean, apart from the fact that no one will, they may not give it to you for this use, but. 1.3 meter telescope of Aries. Okay. It's a good uh, possibility. It's a very one and one degree field of view telescope designed for making surveys. So if we so can. What is it used for now? I don't know. As a general okay. purpose facility, but uh, when you asked, is there a telescope? Yes, there is, there is okay. a telescope. Now whether they will be able to dedicate substantial amount of their time for such a program for a few years, something we need to, I, mean, I think it's worth it. I think it's the thing to do for such a telescope is a legacy data set will produce. It is, some convincing is required. So it's a bit surprised. I mean, of course, I've uh, you know, been sitting in Siddharth's uh, talks, but you didn't show any picture of the wall up uh, thing. I mean, prisms and stuff. The real thing? Uh, yeah. Oh, the real thing is being assembled in the lab. Okay. It's being built. It's all in bits and pieces in different labs, right? Now. So this prisms coming together was a major thing. Yes. So Siddharth. Has that happened? Or hmm? Putting those putting prisms together, together is a was major supposed thing. to be a big challenge. That's why I said the southern instrument for so Sutherland may go and become online on the sky. I don't know, six to eight months from now, at best. That's a technically paced schedule. You know, uncertainties are there and un unknown thing, but everything works filed in the technically paced schedule and the other one in six months after that. That's a kind of shit. Uh, sorry, thank you. And there's one of these slides you mentioned, I think it was like 25 minutes per field, the exposure time is? Uh... Yeah, for the old sky survey, yeah. Okay. And this is, this is the target even for the wall-up survey. This is 25 minutes is because uh, we want to go a little deep. Here it's 16.5. For the passive survey, we are initially aiming to go to 16 magnitude which makes this slightly shorter than 25 minutes. And what is the polarimetric sensor actually? And how CCD. Is CCD. I didn't get into the instrumentation details. What we are doing is if you, uh, I don't know how much time we have, but um, four objects, these four kind of pattern, right? So each of them is a given star divided into four. So four images of one star. So from just one observation, you can get all polarizations in one shot. So there's no moving component. That's why it is very efficient. No moving component, like a half a plate rotation, et cetera, et cetera, nothing. No retarders, nothing. It's just one shot polarimeter. So in RoboPole, we had these four images on one CCD. But you can't do that for half a degree field of view. So we have four 4K by 4K CCDs in each instrument. So one 4K by 4K covering a half a degree by half a degree of the sky, one image of a star, and four images on four CCDs like that. Okay. So it's the same concept, but built for wider field. Thank you. 
And who is developing this? Uh, this is an existing uh, CCD. Sorry? Are they especially developed for this? No, no. CCD is just uh, E2B standard 4K by 4. I mean, it is picked with certain parameter, optimized and so on, but it's uh, nothing very special about the CCD. The, the, the instrument itself is complicated. It is, it is probably the largest polarization elements with calcite it is ever built. So such pure calcite of that size is almost impossible to get uh, for this Wollaston prism. They basically use Wollaston prisms. You might know about Wollaston prisms. So polarization separation. So the, the company Carl Lambert Corporation is well known for making polarization optics. They struggled for three years, I think, to make that polarization assembly. The, there, is a, there are some challenges, but I thought the instrumentation may be not so much interesting for a crowd, so I kept all that out from the talk. How will you harmonize the observation between the two different telescopes? One of the pictures shows uh, Sorry? the two telescopes, the southern one and the northern sky one. Uh, their field of view and this uh, instrumentation are all the same at the I level. Can't, I can't hear. The, uh, the sensors are of same for the both sensors telescopes? Same. Okay. Identical eight CCDs. Okay, thank you. Because we are doing that survey in the in what is called the yeah again that is a challenge. It is very equivalent to the SDSS R filter, but it's not exactly SDSS R because if you use the standard conventional filters, that filter introduces polarization. So we had to develop a certain kind of coating techniques which minimizes the filter introduced con uh, polarization effects. At this 0.1% level, it becomes non-negligible. So this is not exactly as just as our filter. But anyway, the summary of the thing is, the entire survey is done in one filter, so all four detectors, filters, everything is same. Um, it's a futuristic question, but uh, I understand wallops are heavy in weight. Uh, but is it possible to um, have wallops on space-based uh, observatories? Yeah, of and course. if yes, uh, how will it improve than the present uh, For system this right particular now? science case, going to space does not have a big advantage. It doesn't have this particular science case. But if you look at polarized, optical polarization or visible infrared light polarization as a field, if you want to study... Um, exoplanets, planets around other stars, um, the light from the star itself will be by and large unpolarized, but the light reflecting off the planet at the right wavelengths could be polarized. So that's a way of detecting planets around stars, other stars. And if you want to do them from ground, what happens is the atmosphere spreads out the light from the star so much that the planet gets immersed in the starlight itself, you can't see that. So if you go to space and control the light of the star to a very tiny size, the diffraction limited size, you can start seeing the light from the planet and then polarization becomes very important. But combining polarization with adaptive optics or diffraction limited imaging is another big challenge. So there's a lot of technological challenges that needs to be mastered to get there but definitely it's something, as you said, futuristic. Yeah. No questions from the students? No? <laughs> Everything is crystal clear? <laughs> okay, thank you. Professor Tarun, to give him a small gift as a token of appreciation. So the students, if you come outside and ask me a question, I won't answer. You have to ask the question here in public. <laughs> <laughs>